Well, thank you very much. It's almost the end. I know everyone is tired, but it's going to be fast. I have about 60 slides only. It should be like this. Uh, so this, this presentation is, uh, is called Randomized Bias Control Trials. I have to confess that I like randomized control, control trials in social experiments a lot, not because they are the gold standard of evaluation, but just because they are pure mess all the way through. And then it, it, requires, you, <laughs> it requires you to get quite creative, to actually use the randomization, the, the exogenous variation that you get to get some, some, some parameters that have causal interpretation. Now, this talk is, is about uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with the problem of non-compliance in, in social uh, experiments, which is a problem of internal validity, but is a type of different paper on dealing with this problem of internal validity. Instead of trying to correct for uh, non-compliance or crossover or counter-contamination, I do exactly the opposite. I do believe that when you do have these features, it makes the randomization, especially randomization in social experiments, quite interesting. So the point of the design that I'm going to show is not to correct for them, but actually to use the non-compliance and to make designs of randomizations that induce non-compliance to get causal parameters that are quite complex and far more interesting, in my opinion at least, than the standard every treatment effect in random, randomized control trials. So the idea is to do designs that control, that induce non-compliance in a way that gives you causality. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to motivate the problem with constant data that I, that I use. Then I'm going to go to a standard late. I do not want to offend your knowledge. It's just because I'm going to use late to, to introduce some notation that I'm going to use through the presentation. As Professor Ditton uh, said, non-compliance indeed is a deviation. It's usually perceived as a deviation of the design, creates selection bias, and compromises the internal validity of the randomized control trial. And all the experiments that I, that I examined, they have one way or another a problem of non-compliance. Let me, let me show the case of the Head Start impact study. And this experiment can be understood as following. You have three choices. Choice T1 is a choice when a family decides to get their child and put in this Head Start, which is a, a preschool a program center-based with high quality. The second choice would be the family choose their children and put in the preschool that's other than Head Start, usually with the quality a little bit lower than Head Start. And the third choice would be that the family is not going to give any uh, any early childhood investment to the kid, they are going to be home-based. Now, in this Head Start impact study, they randomized the people into the control group, which does not have access to Head Start, and the treatment group that have access to Head Start. And this table here at the bottom shows what happened in both of the group. I call, the first line here is, uh, is uh, our families that were randomized that should know Head Start. And this, this matrix of zeros and ones, I, I like to call it an incentive matrix, is just, uh, it summarizes uh, the intervention and it says that when you, when you were randomized to the control group, you have no incentive to, to go to Head Start or other programs or, or go to home care. When you were randomi randomized to the Head Start, then you had incentive to actually go to Head Start because you had a position in this center care. And, the randomization, uh, this arm of the randomization did not give incentives to go to other preschools or to, to do home care. Now, if you see the last three columns, these are actually the choice of the families. So families that were randomized to the Head Start, the bottom, 82% indeed went to Head Start, but then you have this 8% that decided not to go to Head Start and go to other uh, uh, preschool -program, pre programs. And you had 10% that went to home care. And if you go to, to, to families that were randomized to the control group, no head start, then you have 14% of these families uh, did not go to head start. So you can get the cause effect of being assigned to no head start and assigned to head start. 
the problem is getting the cause effect of, of Head Start versus, say, uh, no preschool is much harder because uh, you have confidence in non-compliance, and non-compliance, they are not random. They generate selection bias. Uh, this, this other randomized control trial is the Movich Opportunity. It's a housing experiment, and it can be understood with three choices. You have the first choice is, uh, is, is, is if a family decides to live in a low poverty neighborhood, T1. The second choice, the family decides to live in a medium poverty neighborhood, T2. And the third choice, the family decides to go to a high poverty neighborhood. And in this case, instead of two randomization arms, you had three randomization arms. The first, Z0, you had no voucher. The second one, the families received a rent subsidizing voucher that could be used if the family decided to live in a low poverty neighborhood. And the third arm, they receive a voucher that could be used to subsidize rent if the family decides to live in a low or medium poverty neighborhood. And again, the incentive matrix for this is going to be this one at the bottom. So the first line is associated with no voucher, and you have no incentive to move to a low, medium, or high poverty neighborhood. The second line is the line associated with the experimental voucher, in which the family receives a voucher that incentivizes families to live in a low poverty neighborhood. Cannot use the, use the voucher to go to medium or high poverty neighborhood. And the third one, is the voucher that the family could use to go to low or medium poverty neighborhood. So it incentivizes both low or medium poverty neighborhood and not the high. And you can see, for example, in the case of the, the second line, the low poverty neighborhood only, about half of the Asians did not use the voucher to relocate. And in the case of the no voucher, 81% stayed in high poverty neighborhoods, but 4% went to low. And you can see that there's lots of non-compliance. And again, you can get the cause effect of offering a voucher. It's much harder to get the cause effect of, say, uh, uh, the treatment of low poverty neighborhood versus medium poverty neighborhood versus high poverty neighborhood. Great. So the goal again, instead of fighting against non-compliance, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to use a framework that combines both the incentives given by the design and choice axioms to generate a framework that allows me to compute uh, causal parameters <clears throat> by combining these two approaches. It's a simple idea, and as Professor Ditton said, when you have this non-compliance, you do not have a randomization, you have an IV. And then we are going to, to see the, the common late local average treatment effect. Again, just to, just to, to explain some notation that I'm going to use. In this local average treatment effect, I have a choice, T0, when the Asian does not go to college, T1, if the Asian goes to college. You have a, a, a randomization that is a voucher that gives no tuition if the Asian is randomized to Z0 and assigns a 10,000 tuition discount if it turns out that Z1. My response variable, S, is going to be the contrafactual choice of an Asian omega if you were set to no voucher or set to the voucher that gives this 10K tuition discount. So it's unobserved, you only observe one of these two. Then you, all, you know that in this setup we have four types of values that the response type can get. The never takers, guy never go to college. The compliers, they go to college only if they have the discount. The always taker, they always go to college regarding the discount, and the defiers, they go to college if they do not have the discounts, these are the weirdos. Monotonicity, in the English and English, I just kind of put monotonicity a little bit different, but the idea is the same. If the voucher changes from Z0 to Z1, you have, kind of a, you have the, the discount, then you're more likely to go to college. This eliminates the defiers, and that's an important uh, notation. The the remaining response types that I get, I mean, never take as compliers and our stakers, I summarize them in a matrix that I call response matrix. And the response matrix is given here, T0, 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 T1, T1, T1. Each column of my response matrix is called response type. And you know that by eliminating the defiers, I, uh, we, we are able to identify the compliers. Now let's, let's understand 
the same late in a different approach, in a different view. Now I'm going to set an incentive matrix based on, on, on our previous analysis, and this incentive matrix is super simple. If an agent is, uh, is assigned to no tuition, then you have no incentive to either go to college or no college. That's the first line of my incentive matrix, which is the binary two by two matrix. And if he receives the discount, then incentive matrix is zero one, because it doesn't have incentives to not go to college, but has incentives to go to college. Then I'm going to assume that given a choice T, if the incentive increases when you go from Z to Z prime, then the budget set of the agent for a fixed choice T is going to increase. It means the following. Imagine that, imagine that he chose to go to college. From no voucher to voucher, he receives 10K more. With this 10K, he can actually come buy more goods. That's why his budget set increases, simple like this. Now in this approach, if you assume warp, weak axiom of revealed preference, it generates a choice restriction. This choice rest restriction is quite intuitive. It says that if an agent omega is assigned to Z0, no voucher, and decides to go to college, T1, it must be the case that if the same agent omega, when assigned to the voucher, would also go to college. And this is equivalent to monotonicity. So pretty much, we did lots of, 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 of a structure and got exactly the same. It will be important when we go to multiple choice. And just to make sure, I'm going to emphasize the template because the only thing that I'm going to do, I'm just going to generalize this template in many ways. So I started with an incentive matrix. The first column is associated with the choice of not going to college. The second column is associated with the choice of going to college. The first row is associated with the voucher of no tuition. The second row, the voucher of tuition. Then I assume a, cho a choice axiom, the weak axiom of revealed preference. It gives me a choice restriction. This choice, this choice restriction eliminates the defiers and generates my response matrix. Out of this response matrix, that's everything that I need to do my identification analysis and identify the compliance. That's it. Now, the next three slides is just a standard IV model, and it's only useful to say that I only need the response matrix to do all my identification analysis. Given that you know that, we are going to go very fast in the next three slides. So this is the standard IV model. So the treatment is a function of the instrumental Z and the unobserved variable V. That's the confounding variable, confounding variable. And the outcome equation is an outcome, is a function of the treatment and the V and an error term. Both the instrumental variable and the treatment are categorical. This is one example of a response matrix when the instrument takes three values, because it has three lines. And the choice takes values T1, T2, and T3. So it has three lines. In this case, I have seven response types. And the first line is a type of choice when an agent kind of is fixed uh, at a value Z1. The second one is the counterfactual choice for Z2. The third one is the counterfactual a choice for Z3, and then we have seven possible types of behavior. B2, B, T2 is simply an indicator that takes value one if uh, the choice in the response matrix is equal to T2, nothing more. Why it's important? Because I only need BT, this binary matrix, for all my identification analysis. The first part of that equation is observed, is the expectation of the outcome multiplied by, by a choice indicator condition on the instrument. This is equal, we can show, that this is equal to a summation over the terms BT, which comes from this binary matrix, times something that would like to identify. That's the expectation of the counterfactual outcome YT, condition on the response types. I would like to identify the second part of the equation, which is unobserved, and I have the observed, and the matrix BT is based on the response matrix, which is none. To identify this, if BT, for instance, it has full rank, I just invert the BT. So I get BT minus one times EZ, which is the vector of observer uh, parameters, is going to be equal to the vector of an observer parameter. So pretty much just to say that, hey, all the identification analysis boils down to the response matrix, nothing more. Okay, now the next four slides 
is the choice equation. Because up to, the, up to this point, we know that, hey, if I get my hands in the response matrix, our identification analysis is going to be based on the response matrix. The second part adds a choice structure and incentives to this framework. Because based on that, I'm going to see how the design of the randomization is going to affect the shape of the response matrix. My, my model has only four ingredients. The first one is a choice structure. The second one is the incentive matrix itself. We already have seen. A choice structure is just kind of you have choice and you have kind of the budget sets. The incentive matrix is connected with kind of the choice model via this inequality with incentives and uh, uh, this connection of budget sets. Yes. Given a, given a choice T, if the incentive increase from Z to Z prime, then the budget set of the individual for this choice T also increase. And in this setup, we put choice axioms. For example, weak, weak axiom of revealer preference, strong axioms, axiom of revealer preference, or can assume that the treatment choice is a normal good. That's the framework. Now, let's see how it works. In the case of the warp, if I if I use this framework, I can generate a choice restriction rule. This is the choice restriction rule that is based on only assuming the weak axiom of revealer preference. It says the following. If the Asian omega under Z chooses T, choice T, so it is the case that he does not choose, say, T prime. The part in the middle says that if the incentive gain for going from Z to Z prime for T prime is less than the incentive gain from going to Z to Z prime for T prime, then it must be the case that at Z prime, he doesn't choose T prime. It's quite intuitive. OK, great. Now let's see how it works. So the identification strategy, I start with the design of experiment. Then <clears throat> that's my incentive matrix. I assume some choice axiom, I get choice restrictions. Out of these choice restrictions, I get the response matrix. Out of the response matrix, I get the identification analysis. Now let me get one potential design of uh, intervention design. In this one, I have three choices. Someone can choose college, they can go to college and, and do medicine, economics, or law. And then in this design, the uh, the department associated with each one of these courses decided they are going to randomize three types of vouchers. The first one, give discount only to medicine. The second one, give discount only to economics. And the third one, give discount to both, to either economics or medicine. No one likes law, so there is no discount for law. This design of incentives is represented by this incentive matrix. So the first line, there is only incentives for, for medicine. The second line, Z2, there is only incentive for economics, T2. And the third line, you have Z3, there is discount for medicine, T1, and economics, T2, but not for law, T3. When I apply, when I apply this incentive matrix to weak axiom of regular preference, I have seven choice restrictions that are given over there. Just using the choice restriction uh, rule on the top. I'm just going to read the first one, it says the following. If the Asian omega uh, is assigned to Z2, we incentivize choice two, but it turns out that he chooses T1, it does not have incentives for T1, then it must be the case that at Z1, when he has incentive for T1, he's going to choose T1, that's it. So each one of them are quite intuitive. Out of these seven choice restrictions, these, se these response matrix with seven response types, they group all the possible response types that comply with all the seven choice restrictions. So I start with the incentive matrix, I assume warp, I get that response matrix over there. Great. Out of this response matrix, then I use the formula, which pretty much uh, is simply kind of generalization of the inverse of BT. And out of this formula, I can identify all the response type probabilities for each one of the seven response types, we one, two, three until seven, and I can also identify the expectation of YT1, condition response type one. Response type one is the type of student that always choose T1, which is medicine regardless of the incentive, 
The response type T2 is the one that I always choose uh, economics. The three, the one I always choose law. And the fourth one is the one that choose, uh, well, he really likes medicine, but if there is a uh, incentive only to economics, then he's going to choose economics and so forth. And you can identify all these counterfactual outcomes. And you can also identify the expectation of, uh, of uh, YT1 minus the choice of not choosing T1 for response type S4 and S6. But now this whole analysis, I only kind of is pretty much summarize that, hey, I have incentive matrix. Out of this incentive matrix, I'm going to have a response matrix. Out of this response matrix, I'm going to identify a bunch of parameters. So if I manipulate the incentive matrix, I manipulate the type of parameters that I identify. Now you can say, why don't you simply use monotonicity? Well, two reasons. First, here, I only use weak axiom of revealer preference, which is quite easily def uh, defendable. The second point is that this specific response matrix is a type of non-monotonic response matrix. There is no set of monotonicity restrictions like the one that I used before that would generate this type of response matrix. Now we can also revisit the case of MTO. And in the case of MTO, if I apply the same methodology, I would have seven response types as well and I would be able to identify each one uh, of these response uh, types probabilities, and I also would be able to identify a range of counterfactual outcomes based on this response matrix. So what, what looked like a, a problem that was quite hard to solve, just using choice axiom, you can actually get lots of causal parameters. But then you may think that that we can actually always get causal parameters. And that's not the case. That comes the part of the design of the interventions. The standard way that people think about interventions, imagine that you have three choices, for example, T1, T2, and T3, will be you're going to randomize voucher or incentives. And the first one would be the control group, that you do not have any, any incentive. The second one would be the type of incentives that you are going to, to incentivize the second choice. And the third one will be the type of sentence that would sent by the third choice. Under non-compliance, this type of design generates eight response types and generates a non-identified model. By non-identified, I mean that I do not have a single parameter that's point identified, nor the probabilities, nor the counterfactual expectations. Then you can think, OK, we did not get identification because we are using a design that we do not have an incentive for each one of the choices. If you choose the second response matrix that has three vouchers and one incentive for each one of the choices, you get 10 response types. And we only get identification when we redu reduce the number of response types. So in this case, we get an even worse outcome. It's a non-identified -identify model. But if you get the second incentive matrix and switch the number one at the at the uh, top to actually come and put it at the bottom. Now we have the control group with no incentive. We have a second voucher that incentivizes choice one and two, first and second column. And we have the third voucher, Z3, that incentivizes the third choices. Then we have seven response types and an identify model. Interesting, the type of the causal parameters that you identify by using different design differ. So you can actually choose a design to identify the type of, of causal parameter that you would like to identify. Over identified? That's. No, you, you, they, they, let's put it this way. The incentive made it defines what you are going to identify. Oh, yes, yes. No, no, no. But then, then there is, I'm going to show an, an, an example of this. That's actually kind of not true. Because when you get kind of many, many roles, you get many possibilities that people are going to choose given each one of the role. So the incentive matrix actually increase. And indeed, the incentive matrix increases kind of in a faster pace than actually the, the number of roles. I'm going to show you one example of this. OK. Now, in this framework, you can actually generalize and get kind of some really interesting features of incentives and actually kind of the properties of choice. For instance, 
Uh, I call it monotonic incentives, the type of incentives that when Z goes from Z to Z prime, all the incentives, uh, the, the incentives increase for each, for all of, of the choices. This is indeed kind of the case of MTO. So when you go from one Z to Z prime, it must be the case that all incentives are increased in a weekly sense or decrease in a weekly sense. But you do not have uh, one choice that increases the kind of one Z and decreases for, for another Z. These uh, incentive matrix here are examples of type of monotonic incentives. If the monotonic, if, if the incentive is monotonic in that sense, then you can show that you can express the choice of choice T as a function that, it's a separable function that depends on V and on Z. So it has separability. So inseparability is actually a very useful uh, property for the identification. So in this case, you connect separability to actually properties of incentives and choice axioms. And you also have one type of monotonicity. It says the following. For each one of, for each pair Z and Z prime, it must be the case that the indicator when the choice goes from the choice T goes to one direction or another direction for all the agents. This, I call this another monotonicity, and this another monotonicity does not imply or is implied by the standard monotonicity of Inves and Angus 1994. How can you use this type of another monotonicity? I know people are super, super tired, so I'm going to be super fast right now. Three slides only. So with this incentive matrix here, you have the set of, uh, of choice restrictions. Because of the theorem, this set of choice restrictions are equivalent to a bunch of, to exactly nine monotonic relations. The interesting point that even though it's quite hard to test the choice restrictions using data, it's straightforward to test these monotonic relations because each one of them implies one relation, one propensity score relation. And this is indeed kind of a model of MTO. And this is actually the test of MTO. By theory, it should, each one of these relationships should hold. There was three, uh, 336 possibilities of these inequalities over there. The MTO comply exactly with each one of them that the, uh, the model would predict. Now, uh, this is a type of robustness test to see if indeed the, the weak axiom of reveal, of reveal a preference that I assume to identify the model actually holds or not. Uh, you can also generate the order in monotony, so in Bezanangris 1994. And it turns out that if the incentive matrix increases in both directions, both kind of in lines, in both in columns, in columns in, in, in rows, then this type of incentive matrix generates the order and monotonicity of Inbes and Angris that Tz increases when Z grows from Z to Z prime for each one of the agents. Now, that's, oh, check it out, that's the last, the last slide, okay? And the last slide is just kind of a really interesting one general result. Uh, it's quite interesting for design of experiments. I call, I call a saturated incentive matrix an incentive matrix, not that's your question, that has all the possibilities of zeros and ones. When you have all the possibilities of zeros and ones, I can show that in this incentive matrix, it generates a response matrix that is non-monotone. I mean, there is no order or another monotonicity that applies. All the probabilities, the response types probabilities are identified, and you identify each one of the uh, uh, expected outcomes for, for response type that have variation on choice. And in the, case of, in the case of three choices, then you have eight possible variations of zeros and ones. Now, what, this is the example, for instance, of the case of, of three choices. Then you have eight variations, eight rules, plus one, zero, 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 zero then they have one, zero, 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 one, and so on until one, one, one. Now, why this type of design is particularly interesting. Because this, this type of design is associated with kind of quite simple rule of how to do randomized control trials. Imagine that you have three choices, and imagine that you have three vouchers, one for each choice. Then you're going to get all the people in our sample, and you're going to randomize the first voucher. Some of them are going to get the voucher, some of them are not going to get the voucher. 
Then you get a second voucher, it do exactly the same. Some of people are not going to get either voucher. Some people are going to get two vouchers. Some people are going to get just one voucher, one or other. Then get the third voucher and do exactly the same. Doing this way, you're going to have all this range of, pot, uh, of zeros and ones in the incentive matrix. And even with another uh, non-compliance, you're going to get a model that because of the non-compliance, you're actually going to identify lots of causal parameters. That's it. I know that you are tired. Any question? Uh, that's a great question. For, from weak axiom to reveal preference to strong axiom of reveal preference, you only kind of get more identification when you have some property that's called cyclicality in the incentive matrix. A cyclical incentive matrix, the incentive matrix that you have a line, and this next line is just kind of the line the previous one shifted one or two or, or, or any uh, number, and the third line is also shifted and shifted and shifted. If all of these kind of lines are cyclical, then that's the only case that the strong axiom of reveal preference gives you more identification power than the weak axiom. Yes, as in the talk about the two papers that they were cited. Yes, in, in, especially coming from the, uh, the quest of uh, researchers. Related it. No? Yes. Okay. Great conference.